What do rusty microwaves have to do with Jesus? And what do they have to do with you and me? I'm Pastor Jason Barnett, and this is the Dirt Pastorman Podcast. Offering from your hands. 
For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations. And in every place incense is offered to my name, and a pure offering. For my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you through a fainting, and you say that the Lord's table is polluted, and that food for it may be despised. What a weariness this is, you say, and you sniff at me, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence, or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in the flock, and vows to give it, yet sacrifices to the Lord was blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is reverence among the nations. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Who's blessed by that reading of the word today? <laughs> so to understand uh, what my rest of my ways have to do with God and the Bible, uh, we're looking at this passage this morning and understand that we serve an awesome God, right? We, we serve a mighty and powerful God. We serve a God who only does good things in our lives. Is that right? And of all the nations of the world, and all the people groups of the world, the Israelites in the Old Testament knew that better than anyone. Their history was one of faith in God and God doing miraculous and impossible things in their midst. And within the Israelites, to the priests who were in charge of presenting the sacrifices to God. And so you would think as the leader of this people who had experienced and known God and, and the fullness of his power, you would, you would expect that they would lead the charge in showing God the honor and respect that he is due. That's not what happens. In fact, now it says they have despised God. And understand something. When you, that says they, they, they despise the name of God, that, that's despising God. When you despise the name of God, when you despise the things of God, that is despising God Himself. And that's what the Israelites were doing, that's what the priests were doing by offering these polluted sacrifices. Upon God's altars. And so when they're confronted in these offerings, that's how they respond in verse 6. Now God the Lord confronts these priests and, and they say, What? Well, what? How do we despise God? This, this isn't a, a question of, of somebody seeking to, to get in the right with God. This isn't someone that's genuinely wanting to know. This isn't someone trying to figure out what God's will is. So they can do it to please God. This is someone asking a question here saying, What do you mean we despise God? This is a defensive question, then trying to defend their place. Because in their minds, they've done nothing wrong. They've been offering these polluted sacrifices for so long that it's just they become numb to it. And now that they're being confronted, they have this how dare you question me attitude. You know, <coughs> don't ever ask a question you don't want the answer to. That's an important life lesson. Don't ever ask a question you don't want the answer to. Don't ask it to God because you can answer it. Whether you want to hear the answer or not. So they, they, they ask Malachi, how, how do we despise the name of God? And what does God say? When you offer blind animals in sacrifice. When you offer the animals that are lame or sick. See, in their minds, they're not guilty. But they're very clearly living in disobedience to the law. But if you go through Leviticus, the book of Deuteronomy, and throughout the law, Time and again, we're guilty that the sacrifice the priests were supposed to offer was supposed to be without blemish. It was supposed to be the best of the best. But they, here they are, they're offering the lame, the sick, and the blind. You 
See, these sacrifices were supposed to be something of value. It was supposed to be a demonstration from, on behalf of, of the people, a person offering the sacrifice, the priest offering, it was supposed to represent that they were willing to even take the best that they had and give it to God to show them how great and how thankful they were to have their God. Instead, they were taking him and laying the sick of him. And, and, and I'm sure in the minds of the priests, they, they had rationalized and said, you know, this sacrifice is only symbolic, right? It, God understands the intent of my heart, so, so what, what really does the sacrifice matter? It, it's, it's just simply a symbol of something else. symbolicness they were offering up something completely useless for God they, they, they knew what God's command was but they intentionally brought something before him that they didn't want and was not honoring God They said they were not guilty, but it's very clear that they're guilty. And they are doing it so much and so often, and, and it's so displeasing to God. That's what God says in verse 10. He says, Oh, that someone among you would shut the temple doors. I, I wish somebody would just come up and close the church down because what you're doing is dishonoring to me. It, it's, it's better if you wouldn't even have services. Because it's so disrespectful. I wish somebody would just come close it down that way. You just you would, you would you could quit coming and offering me these useless things and continuing on in your sin. It would be better off if somebody just come and show you. God wasn't interested in, in their polluted offering. Moving on down to verse 13. The priests have become so complacent in their sin and this practice of offering up the lame, the sick, and the blind animals. That when God confronts them, at first they say, how dare you? But when they find out that they are in the wrong, that they should be doing things the way God has told them to do throughout the law, how do they respond? Oh, what a burden it is. You know how hard it is, God? To, to talk to these people and tell them to quit bringing in the the, the lame, the blind, the sick animals? What, what if I say that to them and they get mad and they leave the church? What if I say that to them and they quit offering up the sacrifices? You know how hard and uncomfortable it's going to make me? It's too much of a burden. God, I get where they're coming from. You know how much that sheep or goat will go for? That nice, perfect one? You know how much money I could get from that? Do you know how good it would taste on my dinner table? They found they become so complacent in their sin that they found offering up these sinful and useless sacrifices was better and less of a burden than offering up to God with their mind. It says they sniff at him. It's like that's like my, my, my kids might tell them they need to go clean the room again. You know, when I say it again, you know, you tell your kids to go clean the room and they come out and say, Daddy, I'm all done, it's all clean, and you go in a look and there's still toys everywhere. No, no, you're not done. You gotta go clean the room. Pop, pop. That little huff, that little puff, right? That's what the priests are doing when God confronts them. And I he asked something else in here. So another occupation here that the offerings were polluted. Uh, these offerings here, these are these are blemished offerings, too. It says uh, in verse 15, you bring what has been taken by violence. 
So not only has some, someone started bringing, people started bringing in the lame, the sick, and the blind sheep and goats to be sacrificed, they are literally going to their neighbor's farm, stealing one of their sheep or lambs, and bringing it in as their own sacrifice. Right? But that's the best kind of sacrifice, right? It didn't cost me anything. I got it for free from my neighbor. He was so generous. Now, again, I've been thinking a lot of the priests in this passage. And Malachi is very clearly directing this, this, this word to the priests of God. But I want you to understand something. The people were just as guilty as the priests were. The people were bringing in these animals. They, they, were, they were volunteering, going and stealing their neighbor's the sheep or goat. And, and bringing into the sanctuary of God, saying, look, I brought my sacrifice to give to God today. Yes, the priest should have rejected those things. I mean, that was just too much trouble for a simple, right? God, God's not really that concerned about symbolic things. So the people followed the disrespectful example set by their priests. And they're offering up these useless, these useless sacrifices to them. So what, what does this have to do with rusty microwaves? The priests and people were offering God a rusty microwave. Yet the book of Leviticus and many other places in life clearly tells us that what the, the sacrifice is supposed to be. But they were blatantly disobeying God. God was looking and saying, hey, I want a hot pocket. And they're bringing a hot pocket covered with side tennis. Act like God was okay with that. I, I didn't point this out in the video, but that, that's true, was it? God says, try taking that to your governor. I think tomorrow morning, show up to the mayor's office with a rusty microwave. Say, hey, I, 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 uh, Mr. Mayor, I brought this in to pay my, my, my local taxes. I figured it was an even trade. Is that cool? John, you, you, you would take a rusty microwave, right? I, I'd take the hot pot. you take the hot pot. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, they wouldn't offer that up to their city officials, but they would offer it to God and think, what do you have to do with it? God, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so, so I guess I can offer him whatever. And he's not going to care. That's what these guys were thinking. They were blatantly being disobedient. They were blatantly being disobedient. Why? Because it was more convenient. Yeah, they were going through the motions. They were doing the things that would, would, clear, you know, would, 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 would seem and come across as they were holy before God, but, they don't, but in reality, the actions were useless. It didn't mean a thing. They were just simply going through the motions. Because it was easy. They offered God's sheep that could that could, that could put on the walk that would line their they were too sick and too most likely not going to survive long, so it wasn't really going to be a big deal if they lost that one particular sheep. This is that one sheep they were hoping that maybe a wolf would come along and, and take it out so they didn't have to waste their time and resources and taking care of it. They might be that one sheep they thought, but well, maybe I'll just take that sheep and hold his head in the water trough a little bit longer to finish him off, you know. <laughs> It's the sheep they didn't want. And they would bring it and they would give it to God and offer it to him as their sacrifice. It was a rusty microwave. Better yet, they'd steal their neighbor's sheep and say, hey, this, this is better. It didn't cost me a thing, but you know what? God doesn't care. God loves me, so I'm going to offer that up to him. And just go on about my life. It's more convenient. So what does this have to do with this? What does this have to do with me? The question I have to ask myself is, am I, when I come, I come before God, am I offering Him a rest of my life? When I sit down and I spend time reading the Bible, am I doing it just to, 
you know, I got five, I got five free minutes between between going to work and or you know, I got 30 minutes here just to, you know, to kill my lust break, so I'm gonna pull out my little version app and read my Bible. Am I, am I doing it that way? Yeah, that's offering God a rest of my foot. You know, you know, I, you know I, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting the grass and I have nothing better to do except for make sure I don't drive it down the back hillside because the grass is wet. You know, I had another so I'm going to pray for God to God now because I have nothing better to do. That's my attitude going into prayer is what I'm offering God a rest of my glory. You know, I'm going to come to church on Sunday because that's the good christian thing to do. I want to sit there for two hours, listen to this, this strange guy talk about listening microwaves, sing a few songs, go home, and I've got my Jesus filled for the week. I worship God, right? That's our attitude. My attitude coming to church. I'm offering God a rest of my way. You know, I, you know, I'm going to come to church and I'm going to sing the songs, but I'm not going to sing the songs if they're from the hymn book. That's your attitude when you come to church. You're offering God a rest of my life. If you come into church and say, you know, I'm only going to sing songs from the hymn book, but only songs from the hymn book that I know and I like, that's offering God a rest of my life. You because what we do in that moment, what, what we do instead of worshiping the good God, the God Almighty, the God that is awesome, that we all agreed to at the beginning of the sermon, that was the question. Walked right into it. You all agreed that God was good, that God was almighty, that God was all powerful. But you tell me, when I come into church, when I do things about my life, the way I worship God is to be based on what's convenient and comfortable for me. That's how you're worshiping God. I'm here to tell you, you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping yourself. And not only are you offering God a rest of my boy, you're walking around carrying it like it's a prized possession. If I come to church and Pastor Jason, stupid Pastor Jason, does another little silly thing that's different during prayer time instead of just praying over the prayer request, and that's my attitude when I come to pray to God at church. I'm offering God a rest of my boy. God doesn't want you to rest in my way. God doesn't deserve you to rest in my way. He doesn't deserve my rest in my way. The book of 1 Peter tells us, you might be thinking about Jason, you know, that I'm not a priest. I'm just me. I'm a priest, the ones who are in trouble for offering up these sacrifices. And I, I, I can say that with you, Pastor. That's not me, you know. All those things you just lifted, Jason, that, that's not really applicable, is it? Because I'm not a priest. That's how we rationalize things for ourselves. But First Peter tells us that you and I, we are the priesthood of believers. We don't have a priest. Jesus is the high priest, and the rest of us, we, we can commune with God on our own. Because why? Because God lives in here. Again, Mr. Jim said, God doesn't live here. God doesn't live up there. God lives here. Therefore, we are all part of the priests of believers. And our job as being a part of that priest of believers, according to 1 Peter 2, is that we are to offer good and acceptable sacrifices to God. Paul goes on to write in Romans chapter 12. He says, the sacrifice, the acceptable sacrifice that you and I are to offer God, the good one that, that Peter talks about, but the one that God is requiring from us, Paul says that, that's, that sacrifice is to be us. We are to be the living sacrifice. And Paul even goes so far as saying that that, that is our reasonable act of worship. 
saying that that, that's the, that's, that that just common sense. Why? Because our Jesus gave everything for us. How can we come into his presence and offer him anything less? Especially our red breast of my community. Here's the truth about following Jesus. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you sleep. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you headspace. It's going to cost you heart pain. It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost everything that you have, everything that you have to offer. Because you and I, as the priests and believers, if we are truly offering God an acceptable sacrifice, a good sacrifice that God will take in the name of Jesus, and the only sacrifice that we can offer Him is ourselves. That's all that we are and all that we have. Our very best. Even if we come into worship and we don't know the song, we're going to sing it anyway. I, I have to share this. So I, mean, I, I shared that we were, we were at a, a, a pastor's gospel retreat this week. And the speaker, he started preaching when he was 17 years old, which I kind of like because I started when I was 16. You know how old he is now? 79. That's 62 years of preaching God's word. And what I love about him is as he was preaching and looking at God's word, there would be moments where you could see as, as God was speaking to him in the moment that he would start bouncing up and down like he was a high school kid. He's been studying words God's word for 62 years. And in that moment, you could tell he was just as excited as he was for the first time he had overheard from God while reading the word. And that was cool. That was awesome. But what was really awesome, here's a seven-year-old guy who's plugged into every phase that the church has been through in the last 60 years. Every style of worship and every single song. It didn't matter if he knew the words or not. He was praising and worshiping God. Because it wasn't about him. It was about worshiping his Savior. God doesn't want our rest of life to praise. He wants us to worship Him as we alone. Right. With everything that we have, everything that we are. God doesn't want my cast offs or afterthoughts, but my best. Is that what I'm getting? Give me. Again, when I mess it down to write a sermon, I don't just open my Bible on Sunday morning and say, well, that's what I'm reading. Mine. I could do that. I've been studying the word long enough. Well, I could probably get away with that for a while. But instead, I don't want to offer God a rusty microwave. I don't want to come to you up here with a rusty microwave and say, hey, this is what I got for you this week. This, this is what the word God gave to me to give to you as a rusty microwave. No, I give God it all the time. That's who God is. That's, that, that's how awesome I think our God is. That's, that's what I believe Him to be the God that I am ever to be. God, can you search my heart? Would you search my mind? Would you, would you examine my ways?
that we are the center of your whole world. God, would you teach me to love you like the way you love me? Time for this week's 30 second takeaway. If all that you have to offer is a rusty microwave, then that is a valuable gift. That's not what's being talked about here. If all you're offering God is your little scraps of time or things that are based on your feelings, then you don't really love him. You're simply trying to check off your religious box. But if you truly love God, you're going to give him the best of you. You're going to give him your full attention. You're going to give him the full pursuit of your life. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Dirt Pass Sermon Podcast. It was recorded live at the Greensburg Church of the Nazarene, located at 31 Bluebird Lane in Greensburg, Kentucky. Thank you to Buzzsprout for hosting this week's episode. And please be sure, no matter what app you're using to listen to this podcast, that you uh, please subscribe and share this episode with somebody you know.